Okay, we're back for part two with Stu McGill. For those who haven't listened, we'd recommend starting at part one. This is going to, that end portion of the podcast, we're just going to take over from where we left off. So Stu, you had initially started the conversation around epidemiology and what Mark and I had briefly talked about in our conversation in our solo podcast. So we'll let you take it from here, Stu. We can go straight into epidemiology, and we know you wanted to share your screen. Right. So I will share my screen, and uh, let's see if we can get this going a bit. And um, I think there we are. Okay. Um, I think I was interpreted as saying I don't consider epidemiology, and I didn't think that's what I said. Peter Atia asked me about the prevalence of acute low back pain, and I said I don't worry about that. And the reason I said that was I can't define it. So as a professor, I could have acute low back pain, which a few times when I was younger, I must admit I had. And I could still go to work because of the low demands of my job. But if I was a carpenter or a fisherman or a, you know, a construction worker, I couldn't. So what was disabling for me uh, or not me was terribly disabling for them. So you see why I could never really get into good discussions about epidemiology when I can't even define the terms. But having said that, I very much studied the clustering of back pain mechanisms around sports and occupations for the reason that certain sports have certain exposures and so do uh, occupations. And uh, one that's interesting, when we look at long distance runners, they don't experience disc height loss. Now, that's very different than recreational soccer players, which is interesting. If we go back to the twin studies, the twin that played recreational soccer tended to retire with flatter discs, a bit more uh, spine arthritis and that thing, compared to the twin who uh, just ran. But there are studies similar to this one here where they show uh, T2 uh, weighting on uh, MRIs, uh, disc height, for example. And the uh, idea here being that the more a person runs, the less height loss uh, they will experience. Um, that's interesting. Uh, and I wonder. Obviously, this is an association. In terms of mechanism, is it that the more distance a runner runs, the less likely it is for them to lift heavy weights? I don't know. It's just a, a hypothesis. Or is there a dose response affecting growth hormones, cytokines, and, and all these kinds of things? But anyway, there is a epi fact, shall we say, associated around a similar exposure, that being running. When we look at some of the occupations like miners, there's evidence that the discs do adapt. And as I mentioned last day, the younger the person, the more undegenerated and the less injured the disc is, it seems there's a chance that it can adapt, but that chance for adaptation is lost once the initial injury occurs and then the degenerative cascade takes over. Um, interestingly, in sports, uh, rowing, one that I've been uh, heavily involved with, uh, many consider disc bulges to be the rower's disease. Um, interestingly enough, there are some sub-associations in rowers. For example, the time spent on a erg versus the actual skull seems to increase the incidence of uh, disc bulges and disabling pain. And yet, there are lifetime rowers who have had zero pain. And when I touch their back, they are like steel. The connective tissue has adapted to be so tough, you can't even palpate their posterior uh, spines. So, Again, as I mentioned last day, this notion of there being phenotypes 
Um, and we see these uh, notions for phenotypes existing across many sports. I introduced the notion of uh, fracturing the end plate, often being the first um, uh, evidence of injury occurring in lifters uh, and how that can be a good thing or a bad thing. It's all a function of how the lifter trains and manages that with uh, deload cycles and time between exposures, uh, etc. Gymnasts. Now, if I said to both of you, who among your sportsmen, your athletes, have pars fractures and spondylolisthesis and then disc disruption? Um, I'm suspecting you would say the gymnasts. The incidence and prevalence is uh, extremely high. It's very difficult to find a high-level gymnast who retires without back pain. Golfers, another sport I've been around for, for 40 years at a very high level. And it's been so interesting to watch the uh, incidence and prevalence over those 40 years. If we go back 40 years, we would see disc annulus delamination or disc tears that we associated with repeated and over uh, rotation twisting. And then the uh, a few leaders in golf started to lift very heavy. And then we saw a little bit of a change with some substantial disc disruption uh and also hip and knee um uh pathologies that didn't seem to exist before interestingly enough the performance didn't go up they didn't hit the ball uh any further it seemed if we use each golfer as their own case control um now that heavy lifting seems to have uh reduced in the last few years um, and and what, another occupation is dentists. It was interesting. The president of the American Dental Association calls me up and says, so McGill, we'd uh, like you to come and do a keynote lecture at our national meeting. And I said, sir, you've got the wrong guy. I'm a spine guy, not a dentist. And he laughed and he said, do you know that the number one reason for unwanted early retirement from dentists is disabling back pain? And We've had these discussions uh, at numerous conferences. Uh, the dentist's posture is a deviated posture, not with high loads, but prolonged deviated postures. And the question has always been, well, do they adapt to poor posture and poor technique or do they get hurt? And the consensus has been, at least at these meetings, is that is the mechanism for them uh, compromising their career. I thought. I don't often do this because I'm not asked, but we are uh, about the only clinic that I know of. When I was at the university, I started the experimental research clinic for back pain, and we followed up with every patient that we ever saw. Um, we subcategorized them based on their mechanism, on the various tests, whether they got better or not, and kept track of it all. So. Uh, I want to make this distinction before we start. We didn't see the uh, back pained people that I would say a clinic like yours would see. No one got back pain and said, oh, we're going to go off to the experimental research clinic at the University of Waterloo. These were the failures. These were people they've already been to physical therapy, the chiropractor, the osteopath, the psychologist, uh, you name it. They'd been to 10 or 12 different. Uh, clinicians prior to coming to the university. They were shooting 0% in terms of success. So that's the patient population. The intervention was a single three-hour session with me where we assessed them, tried to reach a precise uh, understanding of their pain pathway, and then coached for the rest of the three hours a protocol for them to deal with it. And then we had a post six week check in, usually done by phone um, for uh, that follow up. And then within a year to three years, we then followed up. And these are the results that I'm going to show you now. Uh, in that 
uh, one to three year follow up, those patients reported excellent outcome, and that means they really didn't have an issue with their back anymore. If they were classed as flexion intolerant patients, 48% of them said they had excellent outcome. This surprised me. We did a lot better with extension intolerant, 75%. If they had motion intolerance, that's both flexion and extension, we had an 80% success rate. But look what's happening when we uh, uncovered compression intolerance. We only had a 33% success rate. So compression intolerance, that, that's a tough one for us all to deal with. But uh, anyway, I thought you might find that interesting. Then um, the first swipe at the diagnosis. So not very finely cut and defined. This isn't precise, but with the broad categorization of discogenic. So some disc disruption was messing up the mechanics enough to be the main cause of their pain. Less than half a reported excellent outcome. But those who had both disc and facet, almost 80% reported a good outcome or excellent outcome, actually. And when you think about it, very few patients, the primary first injury is to the facet joint. There are a few uh, traumatic cases where, say, someone is back cracked in football or something like that, and they have an extension uh, facet primary. But the most facet patients are secondary to a disc, and they uh, evolve after a couple of years from the disc um, uh, disruption. When we look at specific cat tests that we did during the uh, pain provocation sessions, the McKenzie test is simply laying prone on a plinth and relaxing. Uh, doesn't matter whether they did uh, well. In other words, they said that test reduced or eliminated their pain. 50% uh, said they got better. Well, 50% is a, a, a coin toss. But when we do the prone instability test and they score positive, in other words, we're able to identify a segmental instability causing their symptoms, uh, we're at 50%. But if they don't have that, the uh, predictive ability for excellent outcome goes up to 80%. Uh, compression, 50%. The hip exam, I was surprised at that. I thought that the, the hips, and the findings of either hip asymmetry, which we know from uh, runners and cyclists, for example, is predictive of back pain. We didn't confirm that in our uh, clinical follow-up. Those who had neural tension uh, reduced their ability to report uh, excellent outcome. Um, this is based on patient impression. Did you experience an improvement after seeing McGill? 20% approximately said no. 23% moderate and 60%, yes, they had a substantial improvement. Did you get worse? Almost 10%. Did you continue with the program that was given to them? 70% said yes, 20% said no. And I do recall a few who couldn't even remember coming to the university, <laughs> I guess, which was humbling, but I guess, you know, this is the real world. Some are addled on opiates and uh, all the rest of it. But this I have mentioned on various podcasts. When we take the patients who reported that they'd tried everything and the last resort for them was surgery, if that was their category uh, on intake, uh, that three-hour session uh, resulted in 95% of them avoiding surgery, and they were uh, glad uh, that they did. So I'm just going to... Uh, stop sharing here um, and show and how do I get back to uh, there we go so um, was that somewhat insightful regarding external to the lab pan back pain epidemiology versus internal yeah thanks for uh, sharing that information, Stu. Like you said, it is possible that we misinterpreted what you said on the Peter Tia podcast based on the statement of, you know, Peter asking you about the prevalence of low back pain and you stating that you only focus on, or, you know, you don't worry about that. You focus on the person in front of you. You know, I think other things that came up 
just regarding our concerns around, you know, maybe epidemiology and, and, and the prevalence of low back pain is that during that podcast, a lot of the examples that were given were based on elite athletes. And we know that elite athletes oftentimes aren't necessarily training for optimal health or training for performance and to maximize performance. But I think the other thing that, and not just us, you know, we actually looked at some of the comments of, um, you know, that YouTube video was regarding the statement about ask orthopedic surgeons who they see, who, you know, who get hip replacements and it's the 50 year old power lifters and the 50 year olds who do yoga, you know, and I think if we looked at the data there, they are in the vast minority of, of patients who uh, get hip replacements and it'd be hard to identify if it was the yoga or the power lifting that led to the need for hip replacements. So I think that was one of our concerns there regarding the epidemiology, maybe why I did a callback to that. I don't know if you have any thoughts about, you know, that statement about, you know, the 50 year olds who do yoga or power lifting who require hip replacements. Right. Well, as I said, when you're speaking with somebody uh, and you do a basically a three hour podcast, not everything comes out of your mouth exactly the way you would like it. Um, and I think that that was the case there. But what was going through my mind is uh, I get asked to attend neurology meetings, uh, orthopedic meetings in this particular case, and uh, the society, whoever it is, will invite um, so-called experts to come and give keynote lectures. So I might be the spine guy. They'll have a hip surgeon. They'll have a person, if it's a general medicine, they might have a dermatologist. And then all the keynote speakers sit at a table. And that's when we generate hypotheses. So if you have a dermatologist who's been, uh, a, you know, a well thought of person in their profession at lunch, and they say, um, uh, you know, I love public hot tubs. <laughs> they really supply a lot of patients to me. So if the person's done this for 40 years, that's probably something I want to uh, retain. And I would say uh, orthopods, these are exactly the, the same discussions we have. You ask a spine surgeon. So who, who, can you characterize a person that's sitting? So those are the statements that I've heard and where they come from. So they're fabulous hypothesis generating uh, and if a person's done it for 40 years, I'm going to listen to them. You know, when a cardiologist says, you know, if you ate a plant-based uh, diet, chances are I'll never see you in my uh, waiting room. That's something I'm going to listen to if, if they've been around for 40 years. Anyway, that was the context uh, and what was going through my mind when I said those things. I understand. Yeah, I guess for me, I, you know, I worry about some of like a selection bias, meaning that I, you're probably not aware, Stu, but I have a hip replacement. I've had a hip replacement for 15 years and I've made resources for younger individuals who've had their hips replaced. And so when I consult with people, I see people in their 20s and 30s who've had hip replacements. And through my own experience, if I just focused on that, I might say, you know, the individuals who get hip replacements are in their 20s and 30s. Um, and I, you know, I've had a different experience, not with just with the data, but speaking to orthopedic surgeons and seeing patients in that a lot of these people who get hip replacements, knee replacements often have comorbidities, um, you know, other metabolic conditions and not necessarily the more active patients. And I think our concern and maybe concern of others is that we want to promote physical activity as much as we can, because we know that the majority of people aren't meeting the physical activity guidelines. And not to say that what your statement was doing was trying to deter people from being active, because we know based on our part one conversation that you are very adamant about um, individuals being active, but we didn't necessarily want people to misinterpret that as saying, you shouldn't lift weights or you shouldn't do yoga or you shouldn't do whatever you know, physical activity they might want to partake in. Yeah, well, I, I get what you said 100%, Mark. Uh, no argument there. 
Uh, in fact, Peter pulled me up. Uh, I, I don't know if it was at that part in the podcast, but he said, wait a second now. We don't want to promote this idea of avoiding activity. I said, no, no, no. If I if that's what I said, I, I don't want that to be the takeaway message. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, you're absolutely correct. I uh, have spent my career uh, promoting uh, the... Well, I, let, let me put it this way. When you look, I think of another keynote that I gave at a, at a, 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 a meeting where the theme was, look at every system in the body. Every single one of them thrives on stress. And I think I mentioned this in, in, in the first uh, section of this as well. Uh, it's ruled by a tipping point, uh, not too much and not too little, but we absolutely need stress. And because we don't live uh, in the caves anymore, we have to make artis artificial stress. And that is exercise. And, uh, you know, to strengthen your point. Anyway, um, if, if that's how I came across, that has to be corrected. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and you made a point about moderates, which, you know, I think you were prom promoting like moderation with physical activity with different things. And I think we would probably really agree with that, especially, you know, in youth athletes and, and people just trying to be physically active is, you know, not being this like one sport specialization can actually be helpful. You know, someone like me, I do a variety of exercise and I'm not necessarily trying to, you know, compete, not that I could anyway, but I'm not trying to compete in the Olympics or, you know, be at the most elite level. Um, and I think we agree there too, that yeah, having, you know, a wide variety of, of physical activity and, and maybe doing some things in moderation, um, you know, probably are helpful for, uh, certain conditions. Agreed. Right. <laughs> Stu, it's we're... interesting, you know, uh, <laughs> I consider myself sometimes a tuner, a, a, a tuner uh, of an athlete, and uh, I'll start the conversation off with the athlete and their coach or their 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 medical team, as sometimes the whole group of them come. I'll say, "What's the weakest part of your game? What is the one physicality that you don't have that, if you had, it would really change you in terms of resilience uh, for injury and uh, in performance." And so, sometimes they stop dead in their tracks. And, and I'll say, well, how do you know what you're training for if you can't answer that question? So it's a huge question that a lot of people don't think about. But anyway, um, to your point, I, I, I agree. Stu, where would you like to go next? Do you want to dive into the, the Mego Big Three or do you want to go into your thoughts on nonspecific low back pain? Well, um, I, I just have a few slides I'd like to show about the uh, big three. And again, uh, tell about the history a, a, a tiny bit. So if I could start um, this way and uh, digress a tiny bit and talk about stability uh, and instability. Um, so I'll just stay live uh, if that's OK. We live in a mechanical linkage, our skeleton. If I wanted to wiggle my finger very quickly, it would help me to stiffen the next proximal joint, which is my wrist. Because if I didn't, I wouldn't be very quick and uh, competent. So as we work through the linkage, in order to create distal athleticism, I had to create proximal stability. And you see this, say, in a backhoe machine. The first thing the operator does is put down the stabilizers on the ground, lock it into the ground, and now the arm can pull uh, earth. But that's, that's a fundamental tenant of, of athleticism. In, unless you're uh, swimming, would be an exception, of course, and some ground uh, sports like wrestling, you might need a distal pry and, and distal stability uh, to get internal linkage mobility to, I'm thinking of jujitsu and doing a shrimp, for example. But most other sports, you must establish proximal stability from which all other, mo and you know, I've, there, there's study after study that proved that. Our most recent studies uh, that uh, came out towards the end of my career showing how a proper control from the core um, reduces the ACL load during a drop jump. So 
the hip backed up by a core, a controlled hip guides the knee, whereas the ankle allows it to go. <laughs> it's just such a perfect uh, linkage. So we need proximal stability. That's point number one. Point number two is when the spine becomes injured, it could be an unstable event that caused the injury, but the injury almost always results in instability. Did I show this model the first time? I don't think so. So I, we, I have don't believe you we have a pelvis. This comes from dynamic disc designs, and they make the most biofidelic models. A lot of them are based on our, our laboratory observations. But um, this joint is normal, L5. L3 is normal. L4 has been damaged. So when you lose a little bit of uh, disc height or turgor, it, it, just like an unstable knee, I'm going to apply torques. Do you see where the majority of the motion is? It's at the level of the unstable joint. Now look around the back and we'll see the working of the posterior facet joints. You'll see the facet joints at that level working, but not above uh, and below. As it turns out, uh, when we measure that in a person who's reporting unstable behavior, and that is the precise specific mechanism of their pain, if we perform muscle bracing strategies, whether it's through the obliques or they're doing a post down through the shoulders to activate pecs and lats, whatever it turns out to be, that added stiffness stiffens out that micro movement and their pain is gone. And I, I, I can then go to some uh, neck examples. So with that background, what is the best, most effective, most efficient way to add proximal stability for performance? and to arrest those micro movements that the stability tests in the assessment prove are the triggers of the person's pain. It turned out to be the big three. So we looked at all sorts of uh, so-called stabilization exercises and we were measuring stability. Um, the other thing that we were measuring was spine load because the person has a load limitation while they're injured and in pain. So we had to spare the spine and guarantee stability. The exercises that kept bubbling up superior for achieving that ratio was uh, the bird dog, the various forms of the side plank, and some form of abdominal work that was isometric, like a front plank or a modified curl up, um, etc. So that's where they came from. And then there was a lot more to it as well. I spoke last time about an exercise category being a three-point bend or a cantilever. A cantilever sets up a shear load in the spine. A three-point bend is just a bending load. There's no shear. So in order to establish shear stability, they had to fit the category of a three-point bend. A side plank is a three-point bend. A bird dog is a three-point bend. A side plank only activates one side of the musculature at a time. So it, not quite, but almost halves the load on the spine. You do a side plank on one side and a side plank on the other. It's a very nice manipulation of variables to make it tolerable for a load intolerant uh, person in uh, rehab. So I can go on and on, I suppose, but those that that's some of the foundation of how we converged on the uh, big three. And I can just uh, go now to, um, let's see, now we're going to share the screen. I'll click on that. I'm finally learning how to do this. Thanks for your coaching, Mark. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the big three. So as I said, um, that is the foundation of where they came from and we converged on them. But there's a myth out there. And Peter said, let's talk about your big three uh, as if they are a universal prescription for us. And of course they're not. Um, if a person is needing more control of their core to arrest the micro movements or to add a little bit more proximal stability so that they can run and cut a bit faster, yes, we might choose the big three. But if you look at my book, Back Mechanic, we come up with a precise diagnosis, and then it's a little bit of an algorithm. 
we try and come up with a position of respite. So let's just use this as, a, as an example. I've got two more. This person's proven position of respite, meaning that where can they go when they have their specific back pain just to get a break from it? Well, in this particular woman, laying up prone on her tummy, relaxing with each exhalation was her measured, guaranteed position of respite. She also said, though, that when uh, she had her last acute attack, it came from sneezing. And I said, well, show me how you sneeze. And she had an open fissured disc bulge, very precise, which flexing and sneezing would trigger it. Uh, so we showed her, well, it's, it's not natural, but try and sneeze upwards. And now you won't have an acute attack from that particular mechanism. Um, their stability component might be a side plank. Um, let's say they couldn't stand with zero low back muscle activation. But if we got them to uh, place their ears over their shoulders in stacking their mass during quiet stance, uh, however, they needed a little bit of thoracic extension to be able to achieve that relaxation of the muscle, all right. Their particular strategy chosen mobility component would be a thoracic extension mobilizer. And then uh, for this particular person, then moving on to a foundation, a tuning of their body for pain-free movement, we would choose a uh, bottoms up unilateral carry. So that would be for just one person, but let's go to the next person. And this person is an office worker, uh, a lot of time spent at a computer, sitting causes their troubles. But we found that if they get out of the chair on a regular basis, reach for the ceiling, push, inhale, that gives them uh, relief temporary from their back pain. So that's their respite position. Sitting with a lumbar support was their appropriate spine hygiene. Well, side plank for these people as well, but sitting caused their psoas muscles to, now to use a yonda term, to become tight or to, uh, if they could release the psoas, they would be able to stand in more tension as an example. So that's a very strategic uh, psoas release, pushing the fascial train. And we can talk about that if you like with the same side arm pushing to the ceiling. And then a three point bend uh, for their uh, strength component, shall we say, with the TRX row, a uh, interval walking program to combat the stresses from sitting at the chair all day. And then a third example, just to show the difference, here's a person with occupationally linked back pain. Well, as it turns out, a little bit of a sciatic nerve mobility took their symptoms away. That's their hygiene. Uh, sorry, their respite. Their hygiene was can they pick up a box with sort of a, a golfer style or a Romanian one-legged uh, deadlift? Uh, uh, their stability, their mobility might be uh, a plank with distal mobility with staggered hand stance. Uh, and uh, all kinds of hip work, hip hinging. We talked about the deadlift last time. Maybe if they were load intolerant, we wouldn't do a deadlift. We would do a cable pull through, uh, or we might do a, uh, a rope pull, for example. I don't know. It would all, again, depend on the person's assessment. Um, but uh, uh, there's an example of, I'm not married to the big three at all. They just, from a scientific perspective, keep bubbling up as the superior exercise to achieve that goal if that's uh, the, 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 the desired approach to achieve the outcome. So does that help clarify? Yeah, I think that's helpful, Stu, that maybe, you know, so people don't put you into a box that shows that you do an individualized assessment and that assessment leads to an individualized management plan for individuals. I guess I have a, a question and you can help clarify this. When you use the, the, the term or the terms uh, uh, spine sparing or like a, you know, spine load sparing, is that just the idea that a certain, let's say a barbell back squat is provocative 
and it, it, the load, the actual load associated with that barbell back squat might be provocative for someone's low back. And so you're trying to find ways to tempor temporarily at least reduce that load because later on it shows you showed, hey, maybe they go back to deadlifting. Maybe they go back to some of these other activities. But is the idea of this spine sparing just to temporarily reduce that provocative load? And, and you've found that with the big McGill Big Three, it's a way to train some of the musculature around the trunk um, in maybe a way that isn't provocative for those people? Like as Precisely. you're okay, yeah, the good summary, Mark. And, and I guess I, I, my... <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> I guess my other question, and and maybe this will segue into the the next topic, is I don't know if you'd be able to define like the micro movements or or the assessment of those micro movements. And because like, from my understanding, and this is something that I learned, you know, I learned the prone instability test in physical therapy school. And I know that's probably not the only thing that you use, but from my understanding, that test hasn't been validated. So I, I'm just interested when, you know, when you say micro movements and you're assessing that in patients and then assessing the change in those micro movements, is that something that you're doing with, with imaging or is it more, Hey, they bend over, they have symptoms. We do McGill big three, you know, they bend over again. And now those symptoms are improved. Well, we've done all of those things that, uh, that you've mentioned. Um, but I mean, I've already shown what a micro movement is. You can see a plane is day and we can see that, uh, but you don't need to see it at the time either. Let's say you look at the size of the neural canal all the way through the spine. Uh, and then you see fat facet joints encroaching into the neural canal posteriorly uh, at L4. That's the level where the instability is. You do an, uh, an instability shear test at L4, you can feel the motion. You can feel the antalgia when you run your hand down there. It's definitely at L4. Now probe it with two kilo, or for you Americans, 4.4 uh, .4 pounds. And uh, probe it. And if the person comes in complaining with they get right-sided flank pain going outside of the crest, or maybe it's inside the crest, and then you probe it, L4. Oh, that's my pain. How did you do that? That's exactly my pain to that root on L4. How much more do you need to know? And then there are many characteristics of an unstable joint. The pain migrates. So if they lay in bed on one side and the joint has a micro movement, they'll get an ache, say, at L4. I'll say, put your pain on, put your thumb where the pain is. They will put it on L4. Um, and then I'll say, well, turn the other way. And then they'll say, oh, my left small toe just went numb. What's the fourth root serve? So in other words, it's a crime scene and we're putting together circumstantial evidence, but we convict once the circumstantial evidence layer upon layer upon layer becomes so overwhelming that uh, yes, you see the pathology changing there, uh, but I'm gonna show you some dynamic video uh, fluoroscopy records on very specific um, instabilities uh, for the next question on nonspecific back pain. But anyway, th that's how I would start to uh, uh, answer that question. But, you know, there's a lateral uh, instability probe. Uh, we took the uh, lateral probe from the McKenzie School of uh, Assessment, and I think we improved it a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, we have a... Uh, what is it now? I think close to 20 hour course on assessing specific lumbar low back pain. But anyway, does that, is that a little bit of a, a start on the various layers of evidence that we will um, observe and try and put together? Oh, I, I know. Here's something that you might find interesting. You mentioned is the test specific, reliable, repeatable, all of those uh, metrics that uh, will make a test acceptable and publishable. 
So I was asked, I, I wrote a uh, an opinion piece. It was an editorial in the Archives of Physical Medicine. It was an invited piece. Um, and I had said at a conference, I'm not looking for repeatable tests. And the physical therapists were, were, were quite upset with that because that's what they were taught in school. And I said, I'm looking for probably non-repeatable tests. I'm looking for specific tests. And that, here's what I meant by that. If the test is repeatable, a kid in first year PT school gets exactly the same score as the clinical master teaching the course. It's a repeatable test. They are simple. They don't reveal very much. I'll give you an example of a slump test. A first year student coaches the uh, client to perform the slump test. The master comes along, you get exactly this. But what is causing the pain? You don't have a clue. It's nonspecific. So let's make it specific. The master comes along now and starts to play jazz with the slump test. Um, let's sit up right now and pull up on the chair, grab the seat pan, add a little compression. Might take the pain away. It might increase the pain. Okay, now slouch through the hips, not through the spine. Does that trigger pain? Okay, now drop the chest down. Let's slouch through the spine. Now let's pull the head into flexion. They might say, oh yeah, that caused my pain. But what happens when the patient says, no, you just took my pain away? You've probably identified an underhook. You're pulling the whole neural tract up off the offense that you follow the uh, sclerotome uh, or, or the, the, the myotome or the dermatome, whatever you like, and start coming up with some precision and you're putting this together. So in other words, when the master plays jazz, you hone in with great specificity as to the mechanism. So that's why I spend hours upon hours training people to become masterful at executing a provocation test and pulling out migration of load from one tissue to another, positioning the nerves in different positions. Um, neurodynamics. Have you heard of uh, Michael Shacklock's work? Yeah, uh, there yes. would be an example of very non-repeatable tests, but very highly specific. It's lovely work. So when we follow that through uh, the full orthopedics, full neurology, that's why I love specific tests, which are almost always not uh, repeatable. But a, a junior student has to start somewhere. So yes, let's teach them repeatable tests. They need a foundation. And then after they get clinical mastery, they know how hard do you push? How far do you take a joint? You know, all, all of these kinds of things that comes with uh, clinical mastery. So there's a little bit of an essay <laughs> on uh, why ultimately I hope we're all striving for specific tests and clinical mastery. So not to... And by the way, I'm not there yet. When I'm 90, seeing my last patient, I hope to have reached the level of mastery. <laughs> so not to oversimplify your assessment um, you know, procedures, Stu, but I'm going to try to summarize and you can let me know if I'm on the right path here. So let's say you do have imaging of somebody's lumbar spine. You see certain pathology at a certain segment. You're not necessarily doing, I mean, you can do repeat imaging, but determining problematic areas is based on perhaps, um, you know, palpation, you know, kind of these like, uh, motion segment procedures like this, uh, you know, manual therapy procedures, and then maybe, you know, a combination of other things, taking from Michael Shacklock, taking from McKenzie and, and applying all of those things to determine, I guess, what's maybe most problematic for the patient. Is that correct? Yeah. And a whole lot more. We right. play with uh, psychological demeanor. Uh, oh, I, I give you little stories on that if you'd like. They're so fascinating, but, uh, yeah, depending on who the client, I will do anything where I can obtain an insight into the specific and complicated pathway of their pain. Yeah, you know, I, I had a uh, one of your, um, he was the chief of uh, Homeland Security, you know, the people at the border who uh, 
always give us Canadians a hard time at the airport. Um, I conducted the interview and then afterwards uh, at the end, and his job, by the way, was interrogation. So he was the guy who brings the suspects into the back room and they interrogate them to find out, are, are they really telling the truth before they're let into the uh, U.S.? He says, how did you learn how to do that assessment? He says, that was about the most masterful interrogation. You used all the techniques. And I said, yeah, well, I've studied it. You know, I've, I've really studied how you extract information and get the patient to tell you for the first time, they haven't told anyone else before, some of the things that cause them to have uh, their, their pain and, and some of the things that uh, they need to do to uh, take it away. And some of them you might consider bizarre. I remember, uh, uh, well, I won't mention the name because you would know this person. They're very famous. They're a combat athlete. And I said to them, what, what's the most uh, challenging part of your game as a combat athlete? And he says, it's leaving the dressing room and all my team and walking into the cage. He says, I might die in there. I'm scared. I'm afraid. And if they carry that fear going into the cage, they're stiff and slow. They're going to get knocked out immediately. So they come out dancing to music and and something and get to get in a headspace of complete relaxation and don't you think now that i have to replicate that psychological fear and manipulation somehow so that i can see the true mechanism of their pain that occurs when they get into that fear do you see what i mean it, it it just goes layer upon layer upon layer to to really understand why tricky people, uh, the failures in other words, um, uh, sometimes it it's it's a tragedy when the clinician can't find their pain and they say, oh, the pain's in your head. It was the clinician who defaulted that because they were beyond their expertise. That may ruffle a few feathers, but uh, so be it. You know, I think we agree with, with that statement is that as clinicians, we shouldn't tell patients that the pain is in their head. And I know that that is a statement that uh, patients have, have either heard or they've interpreted that based on what the clinician said. You know, I've seen patients who have made that interpretation and it sounds like you're very uh, thorough with your evaluation and, and you listen to the patient and that's you know, we know that building that trust and that therapeutic relationship or alliance is, is so important. And it seems like um, that's a pivotal component of, of what you do. Chris, did you have a, seem like you had a follow-up maybe. I was going to, and if you want to stay on this topic, Mark, we could, but I was going to switch gears a little bit and, and dive into nonspecific low back pain. If that's all right with you all. Stu. I wanted to start with a few quotes that Mark and I had discussed in that initial podcast um, and wanted to hear your thoughts and then we can dive into it. But you're, from our understanding, you're not a fan of the term nonspecific low back pain. And when Mark and I were chatting about this, we refer to multiple multi-part series and clinical practice guidelines and consensus statements on the management of low back pain, essentially throughout the world. And one of the ones was this multi-part series out of the Lancet a few years ago. And I want to read a, a few quotes that we, we discussed in an earlier episode, and this will help us dive into nonspecific low back pain and, and your thoughts on it. But I'll read a few and then we can go from there. Low back pain is a symptom, not a disease, and can result from several different known or unknown abnormalities or diseases. It is defined by the location of pain, typically between the lower rib margins and the buttocks creases. It is commonly accompanied by pain in one or both legs, and some people with low back pain have associated neurological symptoms in the lower limbs. For nearly all people presenting with low back pain, the specific nociceptive source cannot be identified, and those affected are then classified as having nonspecific low back pain. There are some serious causes of persistent low back pain, i.e. malignancy, vertebral fracture, infection, or inflammatory disorder disorders that require identification and specific management targeting the cause, but these account for very small proportion of cases. So that's one. I want to list a few, and then we can dive into it. 
evidence is insufficient to know whether MRI findings can be of use to predict the future onset or the course of low back pain. Importantly, no evidence exists that imaging improves patient outcomes and guidelines consistently recommend against the, against the routine use of imaging for people without low back pain. So we started with that of, it seems like this big multi-part series has a definition for nonspecific low back pain. It seems like that's what's commonly utilized. And we'd love to hear your thought as to why you're pushing back on that topic or that, um, I guess, concept. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. All of what you said, I agree with. Um, in terms of it's a symptom. There are hundreds of causes and pathways through various layers to end up with that symptom of reported back pain. Where I diverge is uh, if we say nonspecific back pain doesn't exist, the person, the person listening to that then defaults to say, oh, you have the precise nociceptor creating the pain. No. Uh, but what we can do is add great precision because if a person comes in with nonspecific back pain, do you have any clue at all as to what you're going to do? What happens is if you are a traditional old school chiropractor, you've been taught the art of manipulation, you have a billing code to bill for it. So guess what you're going to get? That. That may or may not be uh, appropriate for that particular person's pain pathway. In fact, uh, I know who wrote those guidelines. I've been invited to sit on the various panels. And they are people who, like all of us, have been in their various medical or sub -med allied medical schools, been taught a procedure, and they have a billing code to bill for it. So it's a crapshoot as to whether or not their specific thing that they're going to apply is, is going to be uh, effective. Um, a surgeon, they're in a different category now because they have a knife. And let's hope their knife can cut the pain out. So they are looking for something that it might be a layer back. It might not be the nociceptor that they're going to cut out, but they're somehow going to change anatomy or mechanics to not trigger that nociceptor, hopefully. Some don't quite operate at that level, but hopefully that, that, that's what they're going to do. Um, this notion that the MRI or an image is somehow linked to pain, that came from radiologists. And in fact, my understanding of the term nonspecific back pain came from the radiology profession. They've never even seen the patient. Uh, I have gone on record many times as saying this is not good practice. If a radiologist who is reporting anatomical features um, saw the patient first, they would have a context. So let me give you an example, a patient, uh, a, a recent one. Um, she was told that she had, oh, a little bit of degenerative disc disease, another nonspecific, and in my view, a garbage term to tell a person. You've got degenerative disc disease. Well, I've got degenerative hair disease and degenerative face disease. I've got wrinkles and white hair. That's what that means. So here's this uh, woman who has been told, I have a degenerative disease, and now the docs tell me my images don't show anything, and they say the pain is in my head. And I said, oh, okay. Um, so I started my probes. And I said, what really triggers your back pain? Because you don't have it now sitting. She says, well, no, I don't. She says, but driving is excruciating. Oh, so I put her into a slump test, absolutely negative. But think of what the, 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 the slump test does. It pulls the whole neural tract cranially from above. It pulls the whole cranial tract from below. If you add a knee extension, the net tension on the nerve through the lumbar spine is pretty close to zero. It's not provocative. And then when she extended her right leg to press on the accelerator, because I had to simulate that in the clinic, because that's what she said caused her pain, bingo, right down the L4 tract. I knew that there was something in the L4 tract that if you pulled it caudally, 
It was a one-to-one -one match with her symptom. Okay, I'm now informed. I now go back to the MRI and I look for on her right-sided accelerator leg L4 root and I trace it through. Bingo, there's a big Tarloff cyst just sitting outside of the foramen. I pull it the other way, I spack, I've got it. So there is a jazz turning a non-specific slump test into something that's very specific and not repeatable. A junior student would never get close to this. And now I knew exactly where to look on the image and I found it, but no radiologist would find it because they didn't know what they were looking for. They were uninformed. So there's an example of uh, why I have the position that I do, that all pain is specific. When a patient says they have pain, in our world, the pain is what they say it is. Now it's up to us to follow it out. Now, it may be that there's pressure on them, or it may be they hate their job. Uh, so there is a psychosocial influence. However, that didn't pull the trigger. The exposure pulled the trigger. Their parents, their anatomy loaded the gun. So when you start putting all of these things together, uh, that's why I say nonspecific low back pain doesn't exist. I never said anything that it has to have knowledge of the specific nociceptor, but quite often that's where we go through the jazz that we play in trying to make each test specific. We can get there and prove it and then get all of this circumstantial evidence and view it in a new light. So uh, I, 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 I'm assuming that sounds a little arrogant, but that's our goal with every patient that we see. They don't have nonspecific back pain. We're going to make it as specific as we can, can to inform what they need to do to wind down their pain sensitivity and build up their body once again, retune it with strategic mobility, stability, endurance, power development, uh, et cetera, so that they can get their life back. Stu? Sorry, uh, that, that was a bit of a lecture. I didn't... <laughs> no, I, I appreciate hearing your thoughts. Um, you know, like you said, like with, with surgeons, the intention is they want to be as specific as possible with cutting out what needs to be cut out or, you know, repair that, what needs to be repaired. But on an individual case, you know, we, we've, I'm sure we've both seen patients who haven't improved when a certain thing was cut out or repaired and from, and, and I'll expand just beyond the, the lumbar spine, but when we look at other regions of the body, the knee, the shoulder, the hip, et cetera, you know, sometimes those surgeries don't always um, improve outcomes compared to, uh, you know, a, a placebo controlled surgery, maybe because some of these base rates of, of these conditions and, and them just being asymptomatic. Um, Do you know finding? what I think the reason is there, Mark? Sorry to interrupt. Yep. It's they did the wrong thing because they didn't do the thorough testing. I think it should be illegal for a surgeon to perform a spine surgery without proving that they know what the mechanism of pain is. Is it difficult? That, that's a pretty strong statement, but there's too much exploratory surgery being done. Okay. I have uh, two follow-up questions, if that's okay, is, you know, you brought up what we said in terms of like the validity and reliability of these tests. Is it, would it be difficult to, to parse that out in a, in let's say uh, some kind of clinical trial, because those tests are unique to you and unique to the patients that you're working with? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I've I've had a few good conversations. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of Pete O'Sullivan at, yes. in Western University. Yeah, at Western Australia. Yeah, Pete and I have talked about this, and and you know we say, well, how are we going to compare all of this? And the only experimental design that we could come up with is is say, well, okay, you take 20 patients, I'll take 20 patients, and and we'll. But you know, the more we talk, there's there's not the people see tremendous differences. And uh, there's many similarities that don't get discussed. Uh, 
you know, when Pete sees a hot disk, he's going to treat a hot disk. <laughs> you can take that to the bank. When I see a psychosocial disorder, a person who's victimized by their pain or they're afraid to move, uh, I'm very much going to uh, attempt to uh, deal with that and empower them to move in a pain-free way, which at the end of the day is cognitive behavioral therapy. Sometimes just having an honest conversation and the person will say, in fact, I had a patient yesterday who, who I had to deliver some not good news particularly and, and uh, one that they didn't want to hear, but they just said, you know, thank you. You're the first one who hasn't treated me like, like a five-year-old. And that was cognitive behavioral therapy for them. If they had a different personality, would I have done that? Probably not. You know, if you have someone who isn't a psychologically solid citizen, that would be the, the wrong tack. Anyway, you, you get where I'm coming from on this a little bit. Um, th this is uh, such an interesting game that we're in. And, now, and it's hard to know what the right thing to do is sometimes. And, and I want to make sure I'm understanding you here correctly, too, is that you said or, or maybe implied, like, maybe it's not always possible uh, or necessary to find the nociceptive source of pain. So just so Chris and I, maybe the listeners are aware, would you categorize, like, let's say you put somebody in your flexion intolerant kind of category or the extension intolerant category, the flexion compression intolerant category. Are those categories what you would define as being specific? Because then those categories are, are um, kind of got you know guiding your your treatment is, is that correct in saying that yeah, or that, that, that's very fair sometimes i can get to the tissue and sometimes i can't but if i can get to the level of if you move a certain way you're guaranteed pain but now i'm going to show you how to tie your shoe without going to that pain trigger problem solved that is the key to get it to desensitize so if a person keeps stubbing their toe every day and they have a really angry toe. I don't care what exercises you do. You're going to have an angry toe. Stop stubbing your toe. So the intervention might be to simply remove the um, uh, repeated activity that keeps it sensitive. So look, let's have a talk about chronic low back pain versus acute low back pain. I very rarely see chronic low back pain. To me, chronic low back pain is the brain has been rewired. It reacts to certain movements, shall we say, with very maladaptive, inappropriate pain response. The myofascial uh, syndromes, etc., uh, syndromes from post-psychological uh, uh, trauma, perhaps. So the brain has been rewired. That's chronic back pain. I get that. Most people, though, they keep all day long, unbeknownst to them, and no clinician has shown them, that they repeatedly offend the trigger. So they think they have chronic low back pain. But if I say, if they have a hot disc with an open posterior fissure disc bulge, and I'll say, let's hip hinge. Don't move your back. Use your hips. When you sit at your desk, use a lumbar support, etc. Oh, I had my first pain-free day yesterday. Oh, and then I went back and I sat on a sloppy couch at my friend's house watching the TV and my symptoms all came back again. I said, yeah, well, you hadn't built it up just enough yet. <laughs> enough robustness to sit on the couch. Um, so guess what? That experience became your tutor. You learned. You learned where your tipping point is right now. You expanded it out a little bit. Good for you, but now you got to work a little bit harder and uh, uh, add a little bit more uh, robustness at this point in time. So there's a, a little bit of a melding in on uh, chronic versus uh, acute pain. Stu, my understanding is chronic low back pain is just de defined by the duration of symptoms. Is that incorrect? Why do you not agree it with that? It is to me. It is to me because uh, people have chronic low back pain because they haven't been shown what their real triggers are. And once they're shown that, sometimes the resolution is immediate. 
I have papers to to show that. I, I may I go on to uh, that next little section if you like. Um, and it's possible to arrest their pain. So they never had chronic low back pain based on duration. They had repeated mini insults throughout the day uh, that were acute. Stop them and their chronicity goes away. So that's why I don't define it by the time period. I know other people do that. That's that's their definition. Though. I don't have many opinions, do I? <laughs> <laughs> Stu, maybe going back to what you shared early on on your own the clinic, I think it was within Waterloo that you all tracked all these these outcomes, and I think you had said about was it fifty eight percent had positive improvement. There's some that didn't get better, some got worse. To that end, how do you go about navigating that and explaining that of? Sometimes people don't get better. Sometimes they do. Sometimes there's no improvement. If there's this specific source that you're looking for and you're trying to treat it specifically, but they don't improve, how do you go about explaining that to, to those individuals? I, I, I do it as honestly as I can. One, one patient comes to mind. He had three back surgeries. He pulled up his shirt. I nearly cried. The butchery that had gone on in his back. And then I looked at the images on the inside and the surgeon had cut his posterior spine off. And I, I you know, I, I don't know why. Um, there was no way I had the skill to get this man out of pain. Uh, so I, I told him, I'm sorry. I, 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 I cannot help you. The cases of arachnoiditis. So quite often, not always, but quite often it's post-surgical scarring of a nerve root. So the nerve root is grabbed into the fascia or, or something else with the uh, healing process. I can only think of one patient that I've ever helped with arachnoiditis. And we did a nerve flossing uh, routine and it broke free. Now, was it really arachnoiditis? Maybe it wasn't, but uh, that changed their life. But uh, so. You know, I, I remember Gray Cook, who I, I don't know if you know Gray or not, but I remember Gray telling me about 20 years ago, we were sitting over a beer and he looked at me and he, because I, I, you know, I, I, I was classically never trained as a clinician. I was trained as a scientist. <laughs> and uh, I remember Gray just saying, Stu, some things can't be fixed. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> um, but that's, that's, I have a friend. Uh, who is a pediatric oncologist. He used to tell a nine-year-old they're going to die. And now that's very rare in the spine world. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think I've called him, you know, how am I going to deliver this news? And uh, he has a, a TED talk about it, actually. It's very, but it'll, it'll tug at your heartstrings. Anyway, not everything can be fixed. And, uh, excuse my language, but shit happens. And when it does, I have to inform the the person. No, that, uh, it may be that they're, they're well beyond my expertise and maybe some heavy drug regimen or something else may help them. Yeah. I think Mark and I would agree probably for all conditions, there's a, a bell curve or a spectrum of responses. And that's just the reality of interventions and humans and there's not everyone's going to improve in all cases to that point maybe switching gears just a tiny bit on the management plan from what you discussed you shared multiple examples within the the slides earlier of this person is sensitive in these specific positions these are the logical next steps that i'm going to do or perform to get them back to their desired activities I think that goes back to our initial conversation of you're removing or pulling back on the more irritable or provocative positions or loads and slowly returning them back to that over time in a variety of ways. Our understanding and what Mark and I discussed in the previous episode is from 
the research perspective, there doesn't seem to be a superiority of a specific type of exercise or movement to help people manage symptoms. And it seems very exploratory and finding, like you said, what feels the most comfortable for this person at this point in time and is alleviating. And then how do we kind of slowly get back to the thing that in the past was provocative? How specific does it need to be with these stability exercises or the, the, the ones that you're prescribing versus just letting them explore a variety of different positions and sports or activities and say, we don't need to be within the confines of these exercises. Like at what point does it have to be super prescriptive? And at what point can we just let them figure out their own options, if that makes sense? Okay. Well, that's why I gave my own statistics, because the people I see have almost always been through the clinical process to get them back to their previous activities without a lot of specificity. So I've, I'm only, now, I'm sure there are a lot of successes, but I never see them. I only see the failures. So uh, if I'm going to make a difference, uh, I have to define specifically through the assessment and come up with the right exercise, the right tissue load distribution, the right dosage, the right uh, rest schedule, um, et cetera. Uh, that, and, and that's why every person to me isn't a broad category. They're a subject end of one. And uh, the, the prescription, shall we say, is, is specific to them. Um, so getting back to my conversations with Pete O'Sullivan, that's why I had to show my own uh, success rate. Now, if I go to any other clinician and say, what's your success rate? They don't know. And they'll say, well, uh, I think it's this. I said, really? I saw your patient that you discharged last year. They weren't a success. They didn't come back. You thought they didn't come back because you got them better. They didn't come back because you hurt them. So until you do follow-up, which is a very humbling process, I'll tell you, I'm one of the few guys in the world who do it. <laughs> I, I heard one of my surgery colleagues say, nothing um, ruins outcome like follow-up. <laughs> anyway, um, so that that's how, uh, again, I would... Uh, uh, answer, answer that. Um, yep. does, does that help or that have I avoided, help. or I don't want you to give me a buy on any question either. If, if I haven't quite hit it, you, you can. No, ch I think it. the next question that I had is there, it seems to be more and more discussion and research suggesting that specific exercises or specific interventions aren't as specific as what they once thought. Once we once thought from a a rehab perspective, and there's all these contextual surrounding factors to why patients may improve, whether it's their expectation for getting better because they're seeing a provider, the course of the natural history of the condition, the regression to the mean, they're coming in at their worst, and then they, they improve and they have these fluctuations, um, the bedside manner of the clinician, it's all these surrounding factor, factors outside of the treatment itself. If When you're seeing a patient how much of the specific prescription do you think is contributing to the improvement? And how much do you think is your Stu McGill? They're coming to you. You're almost one of the last resorts. You're extremely confident. You're well-spoken. How? What do you think of all these other contextual factors playing into this rehab process? Well, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we all attract a certain category of patients. When I was at the university, we had insurance companies sending us their worst cases. Opioid addicts, uh, people who were really didn't want to work. They were on the insurance uh, liability list and whatnot. That's quite a different clientele than I get now. I live in middle Ontario. I am really hard to get to. If someone comes to me, they're highly motivated. They're usually more educated than not, and they have a bit of money more than not. So do you see how right now um, I, I see a, some 
pretty exceptional people in terms of uh, their athletes or their business people or their politicians or do you know what I mean? They're 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 I'm hard to get to. So you're you're very perceptive when you say they're coming to see Stu Miguel. That's going to create a, a, a certain uh, category. They are highly motivated. Uh, they, I would say, are now more than ever willing to listen to what I do. And if I tell them not to do something, although there, some of the athletes are still bargaining with me. Oh, you mean I, I, I can't go out and train this? And I said, no, that's what got you into the trouble in the first place. <laughs> You are not going to do deadlifts. You are going to push a sled or whatever it happens to be. Um, anyway, uh, so to your point, I do see uh, they're difficult. They've failed every other uh, approach. However, uh, I think I've got the rear. Um, so does that answer that little bit? It certainly wasn't the case, though, when it was the experimental clinic at the university that I would say would be more representative of a typical clinic. That does. Yes. Uh, the specific, uh, 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 the specificity of the exercise, there are a few papers, actually, that do show the superiority of uh, certain exercise approaches uh, to others. Um, but the very best ones are categorized on the pain triggers. So a person who has uh, adjacent segment syndrome, a person who has a stiff back, uh, uh, you know. But uh, if I get back to my subject end of one, it's a, if a person has a really stiff right hip, they can't do certain exercises. Uh, they have to come up with a strategy very specific to them to guarantee that that exercise prescription doesn't trigger their pain. So, you know, if, if uh, every back person would get better by going onto the internet and, and looking at the back exercises here, take this sheet and you'll get better. Well, we both know that that doesn't work. I know. You know it's, it's, by the way, Mark, you and I are hippies. I don't know if you know that. I'm hip replaced as well. And I happen to have, uh, have you ever heard of tip stresses? Do you know what they are? Uh, you can explain and, and, it. So at the post, you know, the prosthesis post goes down your femur. Right at the end of my femur, I have tip stresses. And you can see the bone is remodeling. I'm, I'm uh, like my bone scan is just lit up at the tip. And for the first four years after I had my right hip, uh, I'd walk downstairs and I would have femur pain, not in my hip joint, but right down the femur at, at the end of the tip. I'm very long in the femur and, and the bending stress. So the elastic modulus of the titanium post didn't match the elastic modulus of my long bone. And I got these tip stresses. I can still get them if I uh, do a lot. Uh, I don't have to do that many, actually, deep, heavy squats. I will get the tip stresses back again, and I'm on crutches for two weeks. So uh, do you think a general exercise program, the usual hip exercises are going to work for me? Of course not. <laughs> They're going to really <laughs> upset the apple cart on my hip. I've got to be very, very strategic in the management of uh, what I do. And, uh, you know, I, I, I tell people sometimes on podcasts, they say, well, what do you do for your fitness? And I say, well, I'm, I'm old enough now. I'm allowed to say this. I, I, I live the biblical training week. Two days a week, I strength train. Two days a week, I do mobility. When I was your age, I never did mobility. I didn't need it. God gave it to me. I was perfectly mobile. I need it now. I've got to manage the all the injuries and, and keep them going. Otherwise, I will get a stress concentration somewhere else, and I'll be paying for it. And I, I have an older ticker now. I have to do cardiovascular work. I do those two days a week. One day a week, I take off completely. That's my adaptation. In other words, and I don't do two things the same day. So if my wife's bugging me to go for a bike ride, I'll do it on Monday, but I won't do it Tuesday. I'll say, we're going to go Wednesday. Anyway, so you learn these rules that work for the individual, and the clinician will come up with these, with these rules that work for every single client. But 
one doesn't work for the other. If you have hip stresses or you have a wonky knee or a funny neck or whatever it happens to be, uh, general exercises, you can get away with that with an 18 to a 30 year old. They are resilient. You can be a crappy personal trainer. You can be a crappy therapist and you'll be quite fine with a young clientele. They're resilient and they heal fast. You won't be if you're with a group of veteran football players with the, uh, whoever won the Super Bowl now, I can't even remember. Um, if, if you think you can just do any exercises you like with those guys, you're sadly mistaken. <laughs> Mark, do you have any final questions before we wrap it up? We're almost about to hit an hour and 20 minutes. We appreciate all the time you spent, Stu. I mean, in combination, it's over. Yeah, well, I've enjoyed this. Uh, you, 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 you do hold my feet to the fire, I must say. Um, but uh, yeah, we can uh, think of some more things a little bit later on that you'd I like think we, to, uh... you know, I think we covered most of the topics too. Like, like we said in the last episode, we really appreciate you coming on considering that you had listened to or heard about our previous episode and some of our disagreements and we applaud you for doing that. And we hope other people who may have differing viewpoints are, you know, willing to come on and, and discuss these things because uh, we do think it's for the betterment of the profession to have these types of discussions. So yeah, we just appreciate you coming on and, and being, um, you know, very quick about it. You, you know, we recorded that first episode right away. And then, you know, this episode we recorded um, for people listening, we're recording it a week later. Um, so it was a, a, a quick turnaround for you for both of those episodes. Uh, so we appreciate that. Okay. Well, Chris and Mark, thank you very much. Yes, sir. And good, good luck to, in your in your own practices. And I, I, I wish you continued striving for mastery. It's a lot of fun. What a great profession this is. And uh, I, I know you both know that and you're making your own marks. So good on you too. Thank you, Stu.